Imagine you were living in a third world country and you were at risk of contracting a parasitic disease that follows war, poverty, and suffering. Now imagine that the frontline treatment was developed in the 1940s and the parasite has now grown resistant to its use. Your only alternative at this point is to use repurposed cancer medication. This is the reality that over 1 billion people face who are at risk of contracting Leishmaniasis, the global disease you've probably never heard of. To begin this talk, I'd like to impart some important background information to you all about the disease. So what the parasite is, its vector, how it's spread, etc. So on the left here is a histological stain of the parasite itself, and on the right you, you have here a sandfly. Now, the sandfly is the organism that actually spreads the parasite from organism to organism. Scientifically, we refer to the sandfly as the vector for leishmaniasis. So, the sandfly bites people, it feasts on blood, so as it bites people, the parasite sits in its salivary glands and it's actually released through the saliva into the bloodstream of the future host. It's exactly how mosquitoes transmit malaria, for instance, from person to person. However, one can argue that perhaps a sandfly is more insidious than a mosquito, mainly because of its size. So the smallest known mosquito is about two millimeters in length, and two millimeters is the average length of a sandfly. So it's entirely possible that people don't even know that they're around sandflies or even that they've been bitten by them. So to really emphasize how small a sandfly is, this is a picture of a sandfly biting a person's thumb. And as you can see, the entire length of the sandfly fits in between the space between the edge of the nail and the top edge of the thumb. You can really appreciate how small that is if you look at your own thumb for a second. That is the exact size of a sandfly, or the average length of a sandfly. So you can really appreciate how hard it would be to even see or know you've been bitten by one. So once inside the body, the parasites will encounter the host's non-specific immune system, which is our frontline defense against pathogens. Specifically, they encounter macrophages, and this is a histological stain of some macrophages. So, usually what happens is macrophages will encounter these pathogens, engulf them, and then degrade them inside the cell body. Usually, this would be the end of the story. Unfortunately, when we talk about leishmaniasis, this is only the beginning because the parasite actually thrives inside the macrophage environment. It is inside here that the parasites will eventually fully develop. They will mate inside the macrophage, and ultimately, when the parasite load gets too high, the macrophages will die, rupture, and release the parasites back into the bloodstream. So, just some fair warning, the images on the following slide might be disturbing to some viewers. So, Let's talk about leishmaniasis as a disease itself. There are two forms of leishmaniasis. There's visceral leishmaniasis, or VL, which is characterized by enlargement of the spleen and liver, collectively referred to as hepatosplenomegaly. And as you can see here, this young boy's midsection is totally distended by his enlarged liver. Then there's cutaneous leishmaniasis, or CL, which is more marked by these large open wounds you can see here on the skin. What's more horrifying than the images I just showed you is that oftentimes people who are actually bitten by the parasite, I mean bitten by the sandfly and have the parasite in them, don't manifest symptoms of leishmaniasis months, sometimes even years after being bitten. So it, pro it poses a significant public health challenge to try to actually accurately identify the yearly infection rates. Really all we can do is say how many new infections of leishmaniasis symptoms manifested every year. So this is a map showing you the spread of cutaneous leishmaniasis. It is not as lethal as visceral leishmaniasis, but it is the more common form of the disease with 600,000 to 900,000 new cases annually. And while it is not lethal, people who have these large lesions on their skin experience severe forms of disability occasionally. They are more susceptible to infection because they have these large open wounds. And once these wounds eventually scar over, people in countries with heavy leishmaniasis cases, they often are subject to various forms of social stigma. So this is a map showing you the spread and uh, overall distribution of visceral leishmaniasis. Visceral leishmaniasis in terms of yearly identified cases is much lower, only 60,000 to 90,000 new cases every year. 
but it is a more lethal form of the disease. So visceral leishmaniasis, if left untreated, is typically 100% lethal within about three months. So just to give you all an appreciation for how widespread the issue is, this is a map showing you the total uh, distribution of any kind of leishmaniasis around the globe. So in some countries, you actually have both forms of leishmaniasis. Brazil is one classic example of a nation that has both cutaneous and visceral leishmaniasis. So an interesting caveat I mentioned, on, you might have seen on the earlier slide, is that some countries were highlighted for leishmaniasis and HIV co-infection. So this is an interesting challenge and a very significant one. So what this means is that when people get HIV infection, their specific immunity tends to degrade, their T cells start to die off. Now this presents an opportunity for opportunistic infections like leishmaniasis to take hold. And as I mentioned earlier, leishmaniasis infects the cells that form our non-specific immunity. So in this crucial subpopulation of leishmaniasis cases, you have people whose immune systems, both kinds, specific and non-specific immunity, being ravaged by disease. So countries where you have a significant burden in terms of HIV and leishmaniasis co-infection have an even greater challenge to try to tackle the problem. So the true travesty of leishmaniasis, however, is that it is a disease of poverty. And I cannot emphasize this enough. At the beginning of the talk, I mentioned how the frontline treatments were developed in the 1940s and how the parasite has grown resistant to their use. So to try to combat the issue, cancer medications have been repurposed to try to tackle them. Now, in some cases, these cancer medications can be seen to be effective. However, they're very toxic at the same time. So one drug called pentamidine, while it has been shown to be effective, at least in clinical trials for treating leishmaniasis, patients who use it also run the risk of contracting diabetes. And there's another drug called allopurinol. So allopurinol was originally developed to treat the nausea that comes after taking chemotherapy. Now, its use has been limited by the fact that some patients develop a fatal hypersensitivity to allopurinol, called allopurinol hypersensitivity syndrome. Essentially what happens is they start to lose their epidermis, their oral and nasal mucous membranes become degraded. Eventually this leads to blindness and kidney failure. So it's a, it's a pretty significant problem. So at this point in the talk, many of you may be wondering, how can this problem get any worse or can it? Unfortunately, the answer is yes, because leishmaniasis sits at the intersection of several other global trends, namely armed conflict, climate change, and urbanization. So when I talk about armed conflict, armed conflict is crucial in the spread of leishmaniasis is in that refugees who are from war-torn countries bring the disease with them into the countries they're fleeing. So since the start of the conflict in Syria, for instance, Turkey and other neighboring Arab states have seen an increase in their total number of cutaneous leishmaniasis cases as refugees from Syria enter these nations. Climate change is a hot topic issue, and its tendrils do sneak into the leishmaniasis discussion. However, it's mainly in terms of the vector, the sandfly. So as our planet warms, the suitable environment for the sandfly vector increases, and soon we may see cases of leishmaniasis where there have been none previously. So the European Centers for Disease Control and Prevention actually postulate that as the planet warms, the sandfly vector can actually move from its current areas in Europe, which are typically southern France, Spain, Italy, and go as far as Germany and Switzerland, which are really areas we would not associate with some form of tropical disease. Urbanization is a trickier concept because typically we view urbanization as a means of a country finally industrializing. They're leaving their agricultural roots and they're developing into a more westernized society. However, this also means we have large numbers of people living in an enclosed space. There's no better situation for a disease to thrive. So when it comes to leishmaniasis, as people move for, or commute from rural areas where the sandfly and the parasite are located and they move to these larger cities, they also bring the disease with them. And in an enclosed space, this can be disastrous. We could see potential epidemics as countries with leishmaniasis begin to urbanize. So what can we do about it? And how did we actually get to this point? How did we get to the so-called minute to midnight as this event is titled? 
Well, again, and I cannot emphasize this enough, this is a disease of the less fortunate, it is a disease of the developing world, which means that, number one, the healthcare systems and research and development uh, abilities of these countries are quite limited relative, relative to our own. And number two, since these, since these diseases don't really place too much of a burden on our own healthcare systems, we don't necessarily pay too much attention to them either. I can speak to this from personal experience. I worked in a Lishmaniasis lab when I was in high school, and there my professors were very open in telling me how there was very limited funds for us to study Lishmaniasis, but untold millions to spend on studying heart disease or cancer, which are diseases that place a bigger burden here. And it's also an issue of anonymity. So when I was going to my college interviews and I was talking to people about my research in this lab, I didn't even really get to talk too much about my research because I was spending the entire time discussing what leishmaniasis actually was, why it's such a big deal, and how drug resistance is quite frankly making the problem very complex. So in terms of what we can do about it, currently there are some entities working on the issue. Foremost among these are the World Health Organization, which uh, is currently focused on vector control and disseminating the current available treatments. But as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these treatments are toxic and controlling the vector has proven somewhat hard to do. There's also the Drugs for Neglected Tropical Diseases Initiative, which is focusing on developing a safe oral therapeutic. However, anyone in the biomedical field here knows that how, number one, how difficult it is to actually develop a drug and number two, get that passed for safety standards. So it could be decades before this drug could even see its way into treating patients. So what we need right now is a better way to screen people. As I mentioned earlier, one of the main issues of leishmaniasis is that the symptoms themselves don't manifest until months or even years after an actual infection, but the parasite is still in the bloodstream multiplying. And the other issue is that the current methods of diagnosing leishmaniasis tend to be very invasive or painful. So for example, liver biopsy is the frontline way of diagnosing visceral leishmaniasis. However, in countries whose health systems are being burdened by war or just in general economic downturn, this can be very difficult to do on a large scale. So what we need to do is research biomarkers. We need to find some molecule that's sitting in, that readily available in the blood, that's indicative of leishmaniasis infection. We need to be able to develop a field kit accordingly to be able to screen people en masse. This is the way that we can detect leishmaniasis earlier, and in so doing, we can treat it. So at this point, it's really more of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So to close, I'd like to end with a message to my generation. We're probably the most privileged humans to have ever walked the earth. We are. We've never had to storm the beaches of Normandy. We were never at war with the uh, an evil empire. But what we do have is a significant number of these other issues that are equally daunting, that are going to determine the fate of our civilization in the near future. And it's up to us to use these opportunities and to be grateful for these opportunities and tackle these issues. Thank you.